All right, guys. Thanks for coming. Um, super excited today because we have Bradley Kuzma uh, from MIT Topher Tech. He's going to talk about fractal trees and the stuff that they built in the Topher Tech product. Um, for a lot of you already know Bradley, but for those that you don't, uh, don't know him, his storied career is amazing. Uh, he has a bachelor's, a master's, and a PhD all from MIT. Two bachelors. Two bachelors. He has four degrees from MIT. <laughs> Quadruple beaver. So my bachelor has five degrees from MIT, so we've got you beaten, right? So just run that out there. You can always go back and get a moment. Um, no, I can't. <laughs> Uh, after he graduated, he went to go work for uh, Thinking Machines uh, in the early days in the 1980s, or the 90s. After that, he was a professor at Yale. And after that, he was a senior scientist at Akamai, right? And then after that, he, uh, where he's been for the last uh, about a decade or so, he's been a research scientist at MIT. And for the last six or years or so, he's been involved with Michael Bender on Toku Tech, which is a database startup out of Lexington and New York City. So we're really excited for having Bradley here come today. And uh, thanks for everyone coming. So go for it. So does this mic also amplify? Or? Yeah, yeah, it's going to do, do I need to be amplified for you to hear me? I think I can hear you. Guys. Yeah. So what about the people in the back? Can you hear me? OK. So I also hold the terabyte sorting record. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> in perpetuity, <Yes. laughs> because after after I won it, they retired it because it got down to be one minute. And there's a separate sorting benchmark for how much can you sort in one minute. <laughs> and and so now, if you want to enter the big sorting thing, you have to it's called gray sort after Jim Gray, and it's 100 terabytes, and that takes an hour. So they can never take that away from me. I I, I uh, <laughs> so. This is my sort of, uh, I'm going to bracket this talk with two marketing slides, one at the beginning and one at the very end. Uh, this is really, the reason I'm doing this is to sort of explain what, what the setup is. In this talk, I'm going to mostly talk about data structures and algorithms, but I want you to understand where they fit into uh, the situation. So Tokutech builds a library called the Fractal Tree Library that implements uh, the data structures I'm going to talk about. These are basically logically can be thought of as, as a replacement for a B tree. So below it is a file system. So we just use ordinary file system calls. And there might be disks under here or flash or something. <coughs> Above it is the application. Um, and it, you know, from, from the perspective of, uh, you know, the, of the fractal tree library, the application looks like the MySQL database or MongoDB. Or there might be something else. We have a, we have a file system prototype. And then above, you know, say MySQL, there's an application that's written in the MySQL language or in the, the MongoDB language. So basically, we're, what I'm going to talk about is the stuff in here. I'm not going to talk about how do you do SQL pr processing or query optimization or drivers or any of that stuff. So for database indexes, the abstraction is fairly simple, the thing that we have to implement. Um, there's three operations, maybe four. Uh, there's lookup, which basically, t given an index, looks up. A, a database index is, a, is, a, is in C++ lingo. It's an ordered map. So we want to be able to do a lookup. Given, a given an index, given a key, what's the value associated with that? There's a sequence. Of, there's a collection of keys and values. There's an insert operation where you say, here's a new key and a value, and I would like you to replace if there's already a, a, a key matching that key, I'd like you to overwrite it, otherwise insert it. And there's a next operation which, given a key, says, well, what's the next key in lexicographic order? And this operation is the one that makes everything interesting. Because if we didn't have next operation, we could do lookup and insert with a hash table. And things are a lot easier. So we have to be maintain these orders. And that's why it's an ordered map. Um, I'm going to delay talking about things like acid properties. But I will touch on that briefly. So. If we assume that the database doesn't fit in main memory, how fast can we run these operations? Because if it fits in, fits in main memory, things are going to be very fast. And you know, Michael Stonebreaker goes around talking about doing millions of transactions per second in main memory, and that's great. A lot of data doesn't fit in main memory. And B trees, which is what almost everybody uses, although they're, it's, it's long been known that B trees are essentially optimal for doing lookup, they're not optimal for insert. Well, OK. So before we get into, when we, when I, as soon as I talk about optimality for this and that, I need to have a machine model to talk about it. 
because otherwise you know, it's, I can't do analysis. So for this, I'm going to basically be using the disk access model, which is due to um, Agarwal and Vetter. And the idea here is that there are, uh, there's, a, there's a big memory, which we'll call disk, and a little memory, which we'll call RAM. Sometimes big memory is RAM and little memory is cache, but for this talk, that's what it is. Data is organized in blocks of size B. So these blocks are of known size for this, for this talk. I'm not going to talk about, say, cache oblivious data structures, which we've worked on, um, where you don't know the block size. But the model is that there's some fixed size block, and, and whenever you move data from RAM to disk, it has to be moving in blocks of size B. So if you're just writing one bit, and you want to write it out to disk, well, you have to write B bytes. You don't get to write just one bit. And maybe, you know, so that, and, and, and whenever you bring memory in, the RAM is small, its total size is M, you might have to evict somebody back out to disk because the RAM is too small to hold the entire database. So that's the disk access model. It's a simple model, it's very powerful. There's some better models that are better in the sense they give more accurate analysis, but some of them are harder to do analysis on. And this model, although it's very simple, it doesn't reflect all sorts of strange anomalies about disks. It thinks that any disk block access is the same cost, so it ignores the fact that on disk there's some blocks that are closer to each other than other blocks. We can ignore a lot of that and make a lot of headway. So this is the model I'm going to use for this talk. So here's an example of using some analysis on a very simple data structure. I'm going to scan an array. So I have this big array, and I want to scan it. The big array is size n, and the block size is b. So how many IOs does it take to scan the array? n divided by b, right? Wouldn't it be 2n plus the n? Wouldn't it be 2n divided by b since you still have to send the Send it back. Um, well, for a scan where I'm not modifying it, I don't. I may not have to send it back because I can just evict it without writing it back to disk. Even if I do, even if there is a write back, and you're worried about the fact, factor of two, this talk is mostly going to be about big O. <laughs> Ignore the factor of two behind the curtain. It's it's not important. <laughs> so uh, so it's order n over b IOs. It might actually be less than n over, n over b because it might all actually already be in cache. So this big O, you know, if it turned out to be zero IOs, this is still accurate. That's the way big O works, right? But um, and you know, if you want to get very detailed about it, there may be a block at the beginning and a block at the end, so it may be n over b plus one or plus two or something. As soon as you start getting into that level of detail, it's easy to make a mistake and it kind of gets boring. So. Here's another example, searching in a B tree. We've got this B tree. A B tree, just, just quick review for those who may not remember, a B tree is a search tree. And so in a search tree, everything, there's, there's, you know, there's children that goes down. B trees are of uniform depth, typically. Um, the kind of trees I'm going to talk about have all the values down at the leaves, so they're B plus trees, or you know, there's lots of variants, B star trees, B plus trees. Like, they're all the same from the point of view of this kind of analysis. And everything to the left is less than in lexical graphical order, everything to the right. So the way you do a search is you go to the root of the tree, you have some pivot keys that say, you know, what is the boundary key that's everything over here is less than and everything here is bigger than, and you find the right <coughs> boundary key and you go down the right, the right path and you find the thing. So how many IOs does it take? And, and, and the key thing here is that the fan out is proportional to B. If we've got a block that's, that's four bytes, maybe, we, you know, maybe we don't get very much fan out, but if you have blocks that are, that are you know, even disks, disk block size, you know, four kilobytes, you end up with a fan out of maybe 100 for a lot of databases. And a lot of, a lot of databases um, are now using larger block sizes. So you might see you know, blocks that are 64K or even a megabyte. And so the fan out can be very large. So what is the, what's the number of IOs that it takes in the worst case, because that's big O notation, for, to do a query? Log in. Log in. What? You have it on your slide. Log to the base B of n. Log to the base, yeah, it's small. So, I, so those of you who have poor visions, log to the base B of n, right? And uh, um, this is Michael's uh, drawing of a B tree. <laughs> now, <laughs> he drew that and I showed it to and he showed it to me, and, and I, I, it's like, that's not a B tree. That's, that's a wasp tree. <laughs> 
anyway. <laughs> so the depth of the tree is log base B of N. And that's the same as writing log N divided by log B. Sometimes it's helpful to think of log base B of N as give, giving you a log of B advantage. That's what putting the B on the base of the log does. And this is a concrete example of a search tree that holds a bunch of prime numbers, not all of them. You can also make, you know, and, and, you know so, so Gert, Gert's gro Graf. graphy likes to, uh, likes to point out that, you know, B trees can also be arrays. So if you have a tree that you're not trying to do inserts into, sometimes instead of having these be separate, all separate blocks, if you just write everything into a big array, and then you put a, you create an index array that has every beef item in it, and basically says, so that when I'm doing a search, I can do a, a smaller search here, and then, you know, that, then, I, then I can only have to do a, a restricted search within a single range. I keep doing that recursively up, going up the tree until I get down to one block worth. You can view that as a B tree too, and that, that works very well for static B trees, which will sh which show up, for example, in log structured merge trees, which we'll see in a minute. So the depth of the tree is log base B of N. The search cost is the same. The write cost is the same. The next cost is on average, it's one over B of an IO because once you've already fetched a block, you get to usually fetch B items before you have to go find another block. And with caching, which is an important case, uh, typically all the internal nodes of the tree will end up in cache after, after, after the cache is warmed up anyway. And so the operation costs for B trees in practice turn out to be like one operation per IO. You have to have a really big disk before you can't fit the entire internal uh, 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 nodes, all of the internal nodes into main memory. And if you can't, you probably just need to make the fan out a little bit bigger so that you do, right? You know, a fan, fan out of a million, if you have a million times more disk than you have main memory, you probably want to buy more main memory anyway. It doesn't make sense to spend a million times as much on your disk as your main memory. Okay. So the answer was going backwards. Yeah, all out of. Okay, that's the example of searching in a B tree. Okay, here's an example of searching in an array. And I just have an array. I don't have the B tree index. How many IOs does it take to operate on an array of size n? It's not log base B of n anymore, right? It's just log base two, and um, it's, what happens is you do, a, you do a probe into the middle, you do a probe, and eventually you get down to a single block and you don't have to do any more probes. So it's not log base B of N, it's log base B of how many blocks there are in over B. And, um, and, and that's, but that, I mean, that's log base two of N. And, and I, you know, I've, I'm not gonna be very careful during the rest of this talk about N over B versus N inside the log because it doesn't matter very much. Okay, so here's, here's where we start getting to be interesting. B trees are suboptimal for insertion. Uh, the fastest, and it's like, well, what do you mean suboptimal? Well, the fastest insertion you can do is just to write to a log, <coughs> right? When you write to a log, it's only one over B of an IO, because you get to write B items before you have to do an IO. So um, lookup is really bad for this data structure, right? You have to scan the entire array, which we already know is order n over b. Now, one of the questions here is like, this is a lot less than one, right? If b is a thousand, I'm talking about a thousandth of an IO. You know, if the fan out, you know, this is for relatively small blocks. If I have mega, megabyte size blocks and say records which are a hundred bytes, this could be a, you know, one in a, one in 10,000, or a really, really small number. So how can I do a write and only do a thousandth of an IO, I have to, I have to commit the transaction or something, right? Group commit. Eh, yeah, something like that, but group commit can reduce it. So that write is not because of this data structure. The write at the commit is not because of the data structure, it's because of the commit. And a typical thing that somebody who's putting a database into production does is they put a, a RAID controller with a battery backup in front of the disk to absorb the writes into the log, and writes into a log could be, you know, I write, I append a byte to a log, I append a byte to a log. 
the battery backed up RAID with a very small amount of RAM can absorb all those writes at very high speed because they're not all over disk. Whereas these writes that I'm talking about here, you could be logically inserting here in the B tree, then here, then here, then here, and those become difficult to absorb. But your so, model doesn't have locality. You know, your DAM model doesn't have locality issues, so why would you care where they are on the disk? Um, because the battery backed up RAID isn't part of the, the RAID controller really isn't the disk, right? So, so I'm just, you know, the model doesn't really talk about transactions, right? So if you want to understand the, the practical concern of transactions, you don't have to do a whole I.O. for every transaction because you can, with it's a... With a key locality in it. It hasn't got physical locality in it, the model. The keys have an order, yes. Right, so you're, you're assuming the physical locality is similar to the key locality, <coughs> the ordering of in the keys. That something that's far distance in the key space is actually far distance in the... I'm not assuming that, but in the but if but if in the worst case, if I insert random keys, it doesn't matter what data structure you have. Yeah. It's gonna you know whether you, it doesn't matter what locality scheme you choose because random defeats random defeats you. All right. So let me try it the other way. You are assuming that things that are close together in your submission or in the same B unit of write are not dispersed. That they're one event, and anything else might be is a two events, two, two block writes, and those are arbitrarily far apart. If I do a single insert, I'm assuming that I can update one place on disk. I'm trying to figure, like you said, you're ignoring some, some uh, distance models of disk, the, the, those properties, and I'm wondering whether that ignoring that costs you anything. And I think what you're saying is, if B is a track, then that's local, one operation, one seek, but if you do two of those, they could be arbitrarily far apart. Um, so, you know, getting, it, it, it doesn't matter to first order, uh, and I don't want to, you know, yeah, okay. and, and it turns out it does matter. Yeah. So, you know, you want to you wanna choose the block size appropriately. You want to simultaneously optimize for the number of tracks you look at, and the number of blocks you look at, and the number of 10 percentiles of the disk you look at. You want to minimize the number, you know, the distance, you know, there's a lot you want to do. That's not most of what I'm going to, just, this is a simple model where we're just going to assume the worst thing is, you know, we don't understand the locality between blocks. So yes. we're just, okay. Within a block, we have locality. Between blocks, we're just going to assume that it's one I.O. Can I ask the other one is, do you believe these results apply as well to Flash as they do to this? Um, I'll talk about that in a little bit. So the surprise here is that there are, there are data structures that do as well as a B tree for lookup. Recall that was log-based B event. Yeah. What you, I, you, did, you left out was what, what, what happens with B trees on insert, and I guess it's the same as searching except the factor of log n. Maybe I forgot to, to mention that. Okay, so I guess I mentioned it. I just didn't. I, went, I, I, I lied at it. For the right cost is the same cost. It's log base B of n because I have to go down the tree, which, so it's the same as doing a search first, and then I dirty the page which is maybe one more I.O. Because I eventually have to write that I.O., that, disk, that, that, I.O., that, that dirty block to disk. Does that make sense? Even in the cached, in, cached situation, where all the internal nodes of the tree, I go down the tree and I, and I write the dirty block. Occasionally, there's the tree rebalancing that happens, but rebalancing, every, you know, I talk to people and they say, oh, I don't know why B trees are bad. B, you know, B trees are slow because the rebalancing is expensive. It's like rebalancing hardly ever happens, right? You get to insert B items into a block before you have to split the block. So it, it doesn't matter, at least on average, maybe the worst case behavior is you have to do several IOs, but on average, when you insert a bunch of, you know, you get to insert B items into a block and then you split it and maybe you have to, and then you have to write its parent. And then when you write B squared items into the, into the, into the database, you have to write its parent and its grandparent. But it takes a lot of work to incur those IOs. So it's the same as lookup. Insert is the same as lookup. A cer search for a B tree and lookup and, 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 ins and insert are the same cost asymptotically for a B tree. Yeah. I thought the issue was locking. Insert created much more of a bottleneck to concurrency. So this model doesn't have, con we have not talking about concurrency. Concur the concurrency is basically an in memory uh, <coughs> issue. It's like, because you always let go of all the locks while you're doing IO. You don't block anybody what else while you're doing I/O if you're if you're doing a database right. Tokutech didn't always do that, but uh, <laughs> but uh, 
but it, you let go. You, you don't hold any locks while I/O is happening. So the locks are only held while you're doing an in-memory in operation. This model, the disk access model, CPU cost is free. We're not counting CPU cost. We're counting I/Os. Okay. If you want to talk about concurrency and stuff, yeah, the, the, the data structures do get more complicated when you actually try to make these things go fast on a multi-threaded system. Okay, any other questions? Okay, we'll get back to... So the surprise is that there are data structures that do as well as a B tree for a lookup, which is the log-based B of N, and can do almost this well for insertions. You can... The, this one looks really like a really bad trade-off, right? You've made lookups really slow to make insertions fast. You can do almost that well and, and still do as well as a B-tree. And I'll talk about several data structures here. I'll talk about log-structured merge trees, which are due to O'Neill, um, B to the Epsilon trees, which are um, due to, uh, I always think of Westlake or West, you know, Booksbaum and so forth, and the Cache Oblivious uh, Look-Ahead Array, which is a cache oblivious version, and I'm not going to get to that today, but there are, are even cache oblivious versions of this. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to sketch sketch these out, and then I'm going to talk about some some systems issues. So for log structured merge trees, so the, so how many of you know what a log structured merge tree is? Okay, so some of you, but not all of you. So it's it's good to know what this is. This is a simple data structure, and it really works well. And the idea is that you're going to maintain a collection of sorted runs of data. So in the database world, whenever you have a sorted array of, of rows, that's often called a run. So a run contains key value pairs. It's just an array, and it's sorted in ascending order by key. Some systems, some of these log structured merge trees, use a single file per run. So if you have, if you have a 100 megabyte run, there's one file out there in the file system with 100 megabytes on it. Some of them will say, oh no, runs are, you know, runs comprised of, of files that are smaller pieces. So they, they're having an implicit blocking going on. They might have 10 megabyte pieces. But if you concatenate them together, that's a run. And some systems have options to do both. Cassandra has you know, way too many tuning parameters. And not, a, not as many. And these runs can overlap in their ranges. So, a, so each with a single run is just a sorted array. Two distinct runs are incomparable. They could overlap. They could be one could be less than the other. One, you know, they could be. You know, there's no rules that say how the runs are related. So if you happen to insert the data in sorted order, the runs may be all. You know, it may be that you could cat the runs together and have a have a bigger run. If you're inserting data in a random order, you'll end up with runs that are that are mixed. So here's a little LSM tree. It contains uh, some numbers, and I've, I've started out with those prime numbers, and I've got this, you know, these, this other run where I've inserted some other numbers and another run, and so this is my data structure of, of, of my array of integers, my, my set of integers, and I might at some point merge two of these runs to make a bigger run. So this, this the picture here is that I've merged 8, 9, 12, 15, I don't know if you can see the green, to get a, a larger run. So I started out, you know, one of the operations is, is this. And the way you insert something into this is, well, you just create a little run containing one element. And then you know, they, they, they optimize the first megabyte. They keep one megabyte, they collect it in main memory, and then they write it out. But if you want to be you know, a purist, you write, create a run of size one, and create another run of what size one, maybe merge them into making a run of size two. It's a little bit like, uh, a merge sort that's going on all the time. The way you search in a log structured merge tree is that, well, the first idea is let's just do a search in each of the runs. Is is uh, is 13 in this in this database? So I do a binary search on this one, and no, it's not there. I do a binary search here, no, it's not there. I do a binary search here, and I say, yep, there's 13. It's in the database. If I want to do a next operation, I do a binary search on in each of these runs to find, so the next here is 28, the next one after 13 is here is 15, the next one here is 19, then I have to do, I have to select the smallest. So 15 is the next after. So, so that's, that's how you do a, a search or a next operation. To do, to analyze this, you have to know how long it's going to take to search within a run and how many different runs there are and what their sizes are. If there's only one run or you know, if they're all exponentially distributed in size or if they're, 
if it turns out there's a whole bunch of runs the same sizes, you'll get different answers. And I haven't told you what the policy is exactly for how you manage the size of these runs. And that policy turns out to create a lot of confusion. Uh, I'll, and so I'm going to try to introduce some terminology. Um, so the, uh, again, so I, we already did the binary search on a run, so it's, it's log, log of n. Can we reduce the cost? Well, one thing we can do is when we create that run, we can create a B tree that indexes the run, right? And then that gets us, that saves us a factor of log B, because it takes us from log base B of n to log base B of n from log base two of n IOs. Um, the B tree is really small compared with the actual run. So the cost of creating the B tree, it's only one, one out of B items of the data have to appear up here, right? So I, I scan, as I'm constructing the run, I just select out every Bth item, I insert it into that tree. So it's, it's small potatoes compared to the run. The B tree is generally gonna fit in memory, so I don't have to worry about all the worst cases, because this run, you know, maybe this run doesn't fit in memory, but the B tree does, right? Next question is, sort of again, we've talked about, so we've got, the, we've got the cost of searching a run of size n down to log base b of n. How many runs and what sizes are there are effects is the other piece that's going to affect the analysis. And so there's two kinds of log structured merge trees. And this, this terminology I, I basically got from Mark Callahan at Facebook. He's their, uh, their, their architect for their, their user database, basically, and he, he worries a lot about performance. And so, so he, he gave me this terminology. It's good terminology, so I'm going to go with it. There's two kinds. His brother also works at Tokutech. His brother works at Tokutech, Tim. And, and he was the, the brother at Tokutech was the first sales engineer at Volt DB. It's a good family. Tim, 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 yeah, Tim worked at Volt DB, and he had an application company called Crunch Time or something. So, uh, so, but uh, so this this one, you know, it's like. Everybody's got good relatives, but <laughs> this one's, this is Mark, not Tim. <laughs> so Mark, can, Mark told, explained to me, there's two kinds. There's leveled log structured merge trees and size tiered log structured merge trees. First level trees. So these are used by Cassandra, LevelDB, and RocksDB, and was, in, and was the approach that was described in the original paper about log structured merge trees. Data is organized into levels. Each level contains one run and the, the levels get are, are bigger. So the level zero contains up to a megabyte. Level one co contains a run. If, if it's either it has nothing in it, which is one of the possibilities, or if it does have a run in it, it's between one megabyte and 10 megabytes. Level two con contains between 10 megabytes and 100 megabytes and so forth. That's a sort of typical design choice is that you see a factor of 10. Data starts out in level zero and eventually gets merged into level one then gets merged into level two over its lifetime and, and finally ends up in the, in the highest level at the end of, you know, and then when you delete things, uh, we'll talk about deletes in a minute. So there's one level DB diverges from this one by level zero having um, multiple runs? Uh, so level DB is size tiered, so let me get to that in a minute. Okay. So, um, all right, no, level DB, no, level DB is confusing, so let me, it's hard to figure some of this stuff out. You read the code, you talk to people. And so le accord according to my notes, level DB is a level tree. Um, and the first, the first run is often a special case because it fits, all fits in main memory. You don't really need data structures, disk data structures, when the, when, for the part of the data that fits in memory. So they, they keep it in, a, in just a binary tree in memory until they're ready to write it out and they write it. This is a typical thing. Or, or, they, or they just treat the log the write-ahead log as level, the level zero. If you need to get the level zero data, there it is in the write-ahead log. There's lots of hacks. Okay, so an analysis for the insertion cost. If we assume the growth factor is K, so K was 10 on that example, and the smallest level is a single file size of B, the number of levels in the tree is log base K of N over B, or log base k of n if I ignore the over b. Data moves out of each level once, and then it's remerged into the same level, right? When, when, I, when I'm writing that one megabyte into the 10 megabyte level, well, I started out with a, I might have two megabytes and I merge a megabyte in, now I have three megabytes and I merge a megabyte in and now I have a four megabyte run. That requires, to merge the three and the one into, to get a four requires reading the three and reading the one and writing four. 
right? So we actually, on average, write the same level k over two times. When there's, if the, if the blow up is 10, then the 10 megabyte level gets written, each data item gets rewritten five times on average. The last item only gets written in once, but the first item gets rewritten 10 times. So there's a blow up of something like k. It, the, the, the merge itself only costs one over BIOs per object because you just scan over the data. It's two scans. The scan is one over B per object that you read or write. So the average write cost is k times the number of levels, log k of n over b, divided by b. That's, that's what it works out to be. So if, that, if k is 10, you might have 10. And if the block size is 1,000, so you'd have 10 times log 10 of something divided by 1,000. So that's 100th of log of something. So that's a really small number, right? It's not as good as a log. A log would have done it in 1 over b time per, right? If I just wrote to a log. So the, the blow up compared to logging the data is k log k n. So it's a little worse than a log, but it's only, it's not a lot worse. And, these now, and again, this is a big improvement over a b tree because b trees had one IO in the worst case for every insertion. And here we're talking some log or something divided by 100. Or maybe, you know, if b was, you make the blocks, if you assume the blocks are a megabyte, which is the way these organize things, you know, the, the, the B is, you're dividing by a million, right? So it doesn't matter what that term is. It's, it's a really small number. Okay. The lookup cost. Well, the biggest run is order N. That requires log base B of N. The next run requires log base B of N over K because it's, you know, the, the first one was a terabyte and the next one was 100 gigs. So you have to do log of 100 gigs and then log of 10 gigs and log of 1 gig and so forth. If you sum those up, that's an arithmetic sequence with log b of n as being the big thing. And because when I divide by k, it's like subtracting off uh, a constant, right? It's subtracting log of k. So the number of terms here is basically uh, um, log k. So the total, uh, the total number of IOs you have to do in the worst case, and this is the uncached case, is it's got a log k of n times a log b of n. k and n are both pretty big. K may be 10 and b may be maybe a million or something, or a thousand or a hundred thousand, but it's still a log squared, which is actually pretty painful to do log squared. Even in the cached case, um, <coughs> it's not that great uh, because you end up having to do one read for every level that doesn't fit in main memory. So. In a 10 terabyte database on a 64 gig machine, that might, there might be three runs. The, the last three levels might not fit in main memory. So you might have to do three reads to do a search instead of doing one read, which is what a B tree has to do. So the LSM has really won on insertions, and it's lost a little bit on lookups. And if you look asymptotically, it's lo like lost a log factor, which some people say, ah, oh, log, who cares? Right? Big O, log, as we ignore, we ignore logs. Or some people say, no, no, I really care, in which case maybe you care about the constant. It's three times worse, and people might not like that. So, okay, that's, that's the right cache lookup, the warm cache case. One of the things that people do is they stick a bloom filter on front of, in front of each run. Do you all know what a bloom filter is? Some of you do. Okay, I didn't prepare anything to talk about it, so it, a bloom filter is another data structure that you should find out about if you don't know. And basically, it lets you, for one byte per object, give you a high probability of finding out whether an object is in, in the data structure. Uh, it, it, it never gives you the wrong answer if the object is in the data structure. It always says yes. But if the object's not there, sometimes it gives you the wrong answer. When you're doing this kind of lookup where I'm looking at a bunch of levels, it's OK if once in a while I look in a level that I didn't need to because as long as it only happens one in a hundred times, it's only, it doesn't, it doesn't impact the overall system efficiency. So a bloom filter lets you do that. Unfortunately, there's no way to use bloom filters to reduce the cost of the next operation. So the next operation, bloom filters basically are, take a hash of the object you're looking up and say, is it in there? And it says, well, probably, probably not. 
and you say, okay, uh, or you know, it, or it's definitely not in there, or, or the, 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 it says probably yes or definitely not. Um, so there's no way to use bloom filters to, to fix that, that I know of. It'd be an interesting, interesting, great result if, if, if you could get a bloom filter to, to, to reduce the cost of the next operation. And if you don't care about next operations, then you're using the wrong data structure. You should be using a hash table. So it's kind of a funny situation is that there's this data structure, well, maybe they occasionally need to do a next operation and mostly need to do uh, just point queries where they look something up. So maybe it, maybe it actually does work in that case. But it's a little bit funny if you're trying to say that this, that this is the right data structure to solve your database problems. Okay, the second group, second mode, size tiered. So this is used by Cassandra, which can also use the leveled version. Wired Tiger, HBase, RocksDB, and maybe Bigtable. Um, the idea here is we're not going to organize things in levels in any particular organized ways. We're just going to ha have this process that in the background finds k runs that are close to the same size and merge them together to make a larger run. And usually k is smaller, so k, k equals 4 is typical. You find 4 runs and merge them together. Whereas recall for leveled LSMs, we used, k, we used a, a fan out of 10. So you might see things which are 1 megabyte, 4 megabytes, and 16 megabytes, roughly. Um, here, for merging, data is read from each data from each level only once and written only once. We don't have that problem of merging things in repeatedly into the 10 megabyte bin until it gets up to 10 megabytes. We just take four 1 megabyte files and make a 4 megabyte file. And you know, once data gets into a level, we don't, mer we don't write it again until we write it into the next level. And so you end up, what you end up with then is you end up with k runs in each level because you'll have in the, in, in the, in the 16 megabyte level, you'll have a couple 16 megabyte runs because you haven't got enough yet to make a 64 megabyte run. So briefly you have those four 16 megabyte runs and then you start merging them to make a 64 megabyte run. Yeah. You aren't worrying at all about, about the latency that will occur when you do these advanced merges. Every now and then you're going to do an operation that's going to merge terabyte runs together. It will take five minutes, right? Well, merging a terabyte takes more than five minutes on okay. most hardware. No, so you don't, the, the merge is, the merge, although it has a, it takes a long time, it doesn't actually block anybody. Right? You, you, the way to think of it is that there's a background process that does the merging. And while you're merging these four, four megabyte blocks into a 16 megabyte block, you still have the four megabyte ones lying around. So if somebody wants to query them, you can. And you just don't register the 16, the incomplete 16 gigabyte piece. You don't tell anybody about it yet so that nobody looks inside there because it's, it's incomplete. So you, you, know, you just have to make sure that you, you, you tune things up so that you can keep ahead. Right? If I do way too many insertions and I end up with a, a thousand one megabyte chunks, I should, you know, I've, I've inserted too fast because my, my background process needs to have merged those together. And it's a common failure mode in these practical implementations that in fact they end up with too many chunks at a given level because they have trouble tuning that up. It's possible to tune that up. In fact, it's possible to completely deamortize it with one process. You can basically have a single thread that does an insertion and moves one object from this level to this level and moves one object from this level to this level. And keeps you know, sort of you, know, you can you can deamortize it, but it, it's complicated and it doesn't. I don't think it adds very much insight to what's going on. I, uh, yeah, um, Phil. So the the uh, you have the same key in the data structure more than once. You you always take the one of the smallest one. That would be the in in the leveled version. The the small the one in the smallest level is the newest one. Right. So that gives you memory semantics, right? that you're, when you ask, you get the most recent thing written. For the, the, the size tiered version, you have to be very careful. You have to timestamp them or something to make sure that you get the right answer because there's not, they're not being disciplined about what they merge together. Not necessarily, anyway. You could imagine being disciplined, but the basic data structure doesn't require that kind of discipline. So, so you have to do something to be careful about that. Um, for the leveled one, it's very easy because the small ones are the new data. And if the new data shadows the old data, and there's some databases where you actually want duplicates, 
you don't want to have duplicates be overwrites. It, it, this is not a data structure problem. That's the applications, you know, the, the higher levels problem is to put some sort of unique counter on the, at, at the end of each key to make sure that you don't overwrite, right? Yeah, uh, that, that's, that's, not a, that's not a B tree problem per se, that's. So these, these systems that use the side tier point, they do some sort of time stamping to figure out? They do some sort of time stamping to, to resolve conflicts, yeah. Or they might look in all the Bloom filters and find out, hey, this is, they might, they might do something clever, right? You could say, well, you know, if, if this is being shadowed, I can delete it. In TocoDB, we use um, multi-version concurrency control. So we actually have several versions of the same data lying ar around. So we don't want to, just because some key shadows it, there's also transaction visibility information in there. So we want to keep all the versions around until the system can prove that some version of the row is no longer visible to any possible transaction. So there's you know, s some complexity to actually make that work. A little bit outside of the scope of this talk. So the, the leveling one didn't seem to be in your definition, but the way that I understood it was that uh, you kept the, the run broken up into many files. The files themselves were a lot smaller with non-overlapping ranges, so you tended not to merge them if you could manage it well. They they sometimes try. So 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 the what I talked about was was merging runs. If the runs were single files, you have to rewrite them. If, the, if, the, if each run actually comprises a bunch of different blocks, sometimes you can, you can just reuse a block because you get lucky. Because there's, no there's nobody in between from any of the other right. stuff that's being merged. In the worst case, that doesn't happen. So when, for this kind of analysis, we, we, you know, we argue about worst case, so it's, it's not going to happen. But in a practical system, it's, it, that really can happen, and, and so you can gain something. Um, but it kind of it kind of bothers me when people go off and they they do some hack like that without really having evidence that it's actually going to help them, right? Because well, in practice they're going to do the compaction slowly over time. So if they can work with one file, one sub run at a time, it might overlap a smaller number. Of yeah, there's, there's, yeah. So that might that might also help. Um, and there's compression in here. There's lots of stuff going on that. Okay. So the insertion cost in the size tiered one is, well, we, uh, you know, we have, we only have to write things into each level one time. So we get, we don't have the K here like we had before. We had K log something over B. Now it's just log K over B, but K is smaller, which makes that log base K bigger, but it doesn't make it anywhere as big as, much bigger as the K, multiplying by K. If I say, you know, Make, make k smaller so that k log k versus, you know, versus log k, you go for the smaller k, right? Because, <laughs> uh, lookups in size tiered turn out to be a lot worse, however. Previously, we had lookups where we had log of k times log of b, or, you know, log base k times log of b. Now we have to actually look in k times as many runs. So we've, we've got a straight trade-off here between the cost of insertions and the cost of lookups. And uh, the lookups with cache bloom filters is basically the same as for the leveled one. Um, okay, so here's the, a graphical picture of the two cases. The leveled one has one run of each size, and you'll have a snapshot that looks like this. The size tiered one will have several of a given size, and the snapshot looks like this, and then later we'll merge these into a bigger one, to make a bigger one. Okay, so it's not quite been happy, happy news yet, so I've I, I got eight minutes left. I'm going to get to the good data structure now. I've got 20 minutes. Oh, 20 minutes. 20 minutes, I can do the good data structure. So here's a, da a simple write-optimized data structure. It's still not going to be quite right, but at least it doesn't have a log squared term in the lookup cost. This is a binary tree, and what I've done is I've, I've you know, so binary trees are not very well suited for disks because they only use disks have block size B and the binary tree node is only a couple bytes. So I've got all this extra stuff in the block, so I'm gonna, what I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use that block for something. I'm gonna use it for a buffer for recently inserted data. And basically, I'm, you know, so I have a picture here where this, this data item is gonna show up down, it, it belongs down here in the leaves of the tree, but instead of putting it down there, I'm just gonna put it there. So it's a balanced binary tree, it's got buffers of size B. To insert data, 
I just put the data into the root of the tree, into the buffer at the root. And when a buffer fills up, I flush. So here's a couple insertions, and now it doesn't fit, right? So I push things down. And so it's a very simple data structure. Um, so the, the insertion and deletion cost here is, is well, a buffer cost, a buffer flush costs order one IOs because these are blocks of size B. So yeah, I had to write to and maybe read and write. Maybe, it's, maybe there's six IOs or something, but it's order one IO. And it, it only costs one over B to actually send one item from here to here, yeah? How did you determine the, the, key, the key that's used to determine which elements go left and which elements go right? Well, uh, there's a pivot key inside the binary tree node that says everything to the left is less than this and everything to the right. The, when I did the insertion, I insert the whole row, the, the, the whole key value pair. So I have the key for each of those objects as well as the value. How did you determine which which key would be a good a good a good choice choice to, to remain in the top node? Um, for this, I'm going to assume that the tree is a reasonably balanced tree. So it, it's, maybe it's a red black tree or something. Whatever the red black tree algorithm is for choosing the key, there's some key that roughly divides this into two equally sized pieces. Yeah, right? But it wouldn't necessarily divide the bucket. It might not divide the entire bucket. The bucket may be all inserting to the left, right? So everything may, in fact, go down here, and then everything may go down here. That's actually a good case, right? Because if, if, you're if you're doing insertions that have a lot of locality, that problem's easy to solve. Because now, I, now when I actually get the, lead, the data, you know, if I'm like inserting at the, the left edge of an array, I'm, I'm inserting timestamp data, and timestamps only go up, right? B trees work great for that. So this data structure can also, also work very, very unbalanced to the, to the right if everything you, you insert is greater than that first key you chose? Well, eventually this, tr this tree becomes unbalanced and you have to, and, and you're running a tree balancing algorithm, like a red black tree or a B tree or a two three tree or something. So I, for, as, a, as a subroutine for this talk, I'm assuming that we can maintain trees and that they don't get way out of balance. It could be a weight balanced tree, it could be Lots of choices, okay? But I, I don't want to brush you off too fast, but I, I don't have time to, to do the, uh, that level of data structure here. Um, if, you, if you want to know more about it, I'd be happy to, to spend time on it later. So the analysis of the rights is then that basically, since there's log base two levels, and each level costs one over B, to move a block down because I get to move B blocks for the cost of one right. So uh, it's log base, log of N over B. So that's really good. That's a single log on top with a B on the bottom. That's better than anything we've seen so far for insertions. I guess you could get this performance by, by setting K to be two on a, on a, on a leveled, right, leveled thing. Key, uh, yeah, so key axis. This is another of Michael's drawing. This shows what happens when you sometimes find it difficult to find get to, to get at your keys. Gertz points out that this key does not appear to fat, fit that lock. But okay, so point queries. Well, when we do a search, we normally would just do a, a search going down here to find the thing. What we have to do now is we also have to look in here to find anything that might match the search that we're looking for. If we're doing a next operation, we have to look in here and find all the candidates to be for the next and choose the minimum. So if this is really big, like a megabyte, that means that I don't, that I need a data structure in here. It's an in-memory data structure, but it, you know, it's not a disk data structure, but I need a B tree or, or uh, I need a, a, a binary tree or a, you know, something in here so that I can actually insert things and, and uh, do queries quickly. And, one of the things that, for example, shows up, like if you look at Berkeley DB, Berkeley DB is one of the oldest embedded databases, and it's a great product. You know, the, I'm talking about the classic C version of Berkeley DB, but it, 1980, yeah, 80, you know, late 80s, and but it really behaves badly if you set the block size to a megabyte, mm. because this data structure is a linked list 
for, for this for the B tree. And that's not this data structure. The the list of of the of the children and the pivot keys is a linked list basically within a node, and so it really it goes very badly. So <laughs> because you know. It's, it's, not their, it's not their design space. In 1985, nobody thought that blocks should be a megabyte. And OK, we can make this better in the following way. We've kind of not used, we've made the, we've made the, the lookups. Uh, lookup is log base 2 of n instead of log base b of n. So we want to get that back. That's, that's the game here. So the trick here, and it, I don't know, this, some people say that some, to some people this is obvious and some people this feels like magic or something. I have this block of size B. Instead of having a fan out of two, I'm going to have a fan out of root B. So there's going to be root B children. And I'm going to, instead of having a buffer, I'm going to, I'm going to think of segregate, instead of having a buffer for the entire node, I'm going to think of segregating the buffers so that there's one buffer for each child. Although in TokuDB, we actually just have one big buffer. In this case, B measures elements. B. Um, so I'm so for this whole talk, I'm assuming that elements are order size order one, and so the difference between elements and bytes is only in order one, and that's not at so right. So strings work very poorly on B trees. Right? Yeah, yeah. Everything I've talked about works badly if you try to insert a string that's larger than main memory into your data structure. Yeah. Right? <laughs> that's, and there are but there are data structures that can do that. But I'm not going to talk about them today. There are, there are data structures that you can insert size genomes into, and, and it, it works the way you would hope. That, you know, as fast as you could possibly have hoped for it to work, it actually does work. This data structure is not one of those data structures. None, nothing, has, nothing I've done here works for big strings. So I'm just going to assume to keep things simple, the real system has to solve these problems, it, not for the extreme case of a mega, you know, a, a ten gigabyte string, but you have to deal with strings and databases that are are not order one. Well, if um, we were to build a file system with the data merged into the metadata here, every blob would be a string, and yes, there could be terabyte strings. Yeah, but that's not how we build our file system on top of this. But uh, so we have root b buffers, each of size root b, and those are. For the, there those, here I'm just going to count objects. That's what B is. B is sized in terms of objects. Yeah. Well, okay. The height of this tree is now log base root B of n, because the fan out's root B. But that's asymptotically the same as log base B of n. It's only twice. Right? If you square root the fan out, you only double the depth of the tree. I put on my theory hat, say, ah, the factor of two between log base b of n and log root b of n, it turns out that factor of 2 is, ends up completely swamped out by other engineering concerns. So this is the thing that, is that you get the asymptotics right, and then you can put your engineering hat on and go after the constants. And so you know, the, you know, this factor of 2 doesn't, for example, change the number of, of reads on a query from 1 to 2 when things are cached. It's still 1. You just tune it up so that root b is still big enough that you can fit the entire internal note a data structure into main memory. So that's the tree height is, is order log base b of n. And the insertions cost, now there's a log base b of n instead of log base 2 of n. So that's better. But instead of dividing by b, we divided by root b. Because when we move things down, we can only be guaranteed to be moving root b items instead of b items, which is what we got to do in the binary case. So we gave up a huge factor. If b was a million, we gave up a factor of a thousand on our insert performance in order to get a relatively small factor of log base b of n on our or log, log b, which maybe is to get a factor of 20 or something on our, on our query performance. But that's a good trade-off generally because this is still a lot less than this. So you, you know, if you have one thing that's slow and one thing's fast, if you can make the fast thing a little slower to make the slow thing faster, that usually is a good trade-off. Now this flushing refers to from one level to another. From one level to from one level to another. So there's a yeah, it's basically for the analysis, it's disk to disk. So when I move stuff from this level to this level, I have to read this block in. I have to read this block in. I have to take and move it, and eventually I have to write those out. So it's four IOs in the uncached case. In the cached case, it might be less, because you don't have to actually write dirty blocks until 
either they get evicted or there's a checkpoint or something. So, so it kind of strikes me the player I was talking about earlier that each of these root B subranges now I'm, is the a file of the run at that level. Because they're now they're they're subruns within themselves, not overlapping. Um, but but it's all tuned up to fit within one block. Because remember we're in we're in this disk access model. Oh. That's the point. Is is all of this is one block. So one for one I/O, I can bring in these root B buffers of each size root B. If I think of that file as the limit on the size of a level, ten times bigger each I/O, I get you. No, it's not quite the same. Yeah. Okay. But it turns out that there are connections between these data structures. So if you think about it, they, after a while, they all start looking alike. And you know, the COLA, the things we did to the COLA to make it work well, the COLA is like a log structured merge tree that's got some other stuff stuck in and makes, you know, so it ends up right. looking like that. Um, that's your prior work, right? Well, so, fill, so fractal B trees is, is actually Phil's, Phil's oh. paper, right? Something called that. It's not but it's not this. It's not this stuff. <laughs> so fractal trees is a marketing. Okay. Fractal trees is a marketing term. Okay. <laughs> Notice I didn't really talk about fractal trees except in that first slide where I said libft, right? Okay. We have b to the epsilon trees. We have log structured merge trees. We have colas. These are all technical names. <laughs> fractal trees is whatever Tokatech marketing says it is. Okay, so what do you call this one? Um, this is a b to the epsilon tree. Because and the epsilon here is one half. It turns out there's a trade-off. You can make these blocks smaller and get the fan out bigger, which gives you a trade-off, a very smooth trade-off between the insertion and the lookup cost. So at the extreme end is the one I showed you before, where epsilon was zero, um, and the, the other end is a B tree where epsilon's one. You have you have B children, and the size of the buffers is only one per child, which is essentially every time you insert anything, you all you have to do a push. Okay. Um, so I've talked about write optimization and, how, and the trade-off between writes and reads, and, and in some sense, that's the easy stuff. It's it's the stuff that I think is intellectually interesting, but it's really, at some level, easy. Uh, to build a full feature database is harder. You know, you have to deal with variable-sized rows. You need concurrency control. You have to cope with multi-threading and transactions and logging and crashes and. Um, Special cases for when the data is previously sorted turn out to be important. Uh, real systems do compression. Real systems need to be backed up. And to get all of that stuff to work, well, you know, that's a small matter of programming, right? <laughs> but <laughs> it, it's the hard, it's where all the work is. Um, one of the things that's, that I think is interesting is that, is that there's a bunch of systems work that where you, where you try to apply this kind of write optimized technology and you run into problems because the system somewhere assumed that the search cost was the same as the insert cost. And what this work shows is inserts are a lot cheaper than searches. Inserts are almost as fast as writing to a log. Whereas searches, well, you, by golly, you have to look on disk. And if it doesn't matter what crazy data structure you use, if, if I give you a random key, you're going to have to do a disk head movement. So you don't really get to do very many random searches. That's life, at least with this technology. So an example is there's you know the Berkeley DB API has an, you know has a mode where it returns an error when you insert a duplicate key. I insert something, it says no, that's already there. Well, that requires doing a lookup. Now maybe the bloom filters can mitigate the cost of that lookup, but at some level you have to do that lookup. And or another version is you know. I do a delete and I get told how many items did I delete? Was it zero or one? Well, I could do a delete without, without doing a query. I could just insert a, to a tombstone. And in, in, instead of an insert message, I can insert a tombstone message and then have it go down. And as it goes down, it just annihilates matching keys. Usually these are API semantics where it wasn't important when they first built the first implementation and now right. it is. Yeah. And, and so Martin, uh, Farish Colton, who's the, the, the other founder that Andy, I guess Andy didn't mention Martin. Martin's, there's, there's three technical founders, Michael Bender and, and Martin Farish Colton, who's at Rutgers, and Michael's at Stony Brook, and, and, and me. Um, he calls these crypto searches, not because of cryptography, but because they're hidden in the more traditional sense of crypto is hidden. So they're hidden searches. And they show up, we, sh we found them in the file system. 
we try to use Fuse to build a, a file system. And every time you do anything in Fuse, it does a stat on everything it can, can think of. And stat is a query. And so you end up being throttled to the speed at which queries can run instead of the speed at which the insertions can run. So things didn't get faster. Yeah. So um, uniqueness checking and all sorts of stuff. So, so basically, uh, I think one of the interesting research problems that we've been trying to, and we've been trying to figure out on, on how to do this for a file system is how can you get rid of all those crypto searches so that the file system can, actually can do insertions fast. Well, I go one step further than that, which is there is lost information when you make those changes <coughs> in the API. How do you provide a way for them to it, obtain that information? It's a, yeah, it's a system problem. It's not, you know, this is not an easy problem. It's well, because if you take it out of the API and the user turns around and does, look up followed by insert, then you haven't changed anything in the performance. That's and right. You've made their life harder. Yeah. But in, from a performance point of view, I haven't. You know, they, they could they could they could package that in a library, right? And 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 just call look up with the stupid check. But uh, so so is you know it, it, I, I, there's a bunch of interesting cases for how do you do how do you get rid of these and some some things we found. So um, this this data structure sort of likes fire and forget mess operations. So fire and forget is an insert where you don't care whether there's a duplicate. But there's other fire and forget messages uh, that you can think of like delete or update where you say find the key, you know, key number five and, and it's got some fields, increment the X record, X field inside that row. Um, you can have broadcast versions of these where you say delete everything, delete every key in the database where you just sort of send a message in and, if, and the message works its way down, deleting stuff. Or you could have narrow cast versions where you say, delete every row from here to here. And you could do all those in time, which is both, which is very fast from the perspective of the application, because it just drops this message into the root of the tree, and also has very good average cost, because it, uh, you know, it works well. Flash, so Garth asked about Flash. So one alternative to use is to use B trees on Flash. Um, one problem, the problem on Flash is generally not that they suffer from, you know, read, reads are free on most on Flash. It's the, the best model on Flash is reads just become cheap. You don't, you don't count, you don't care about reads. So that, but, but writes are expensive on Flash, both, be, both because lots of Flashes don't actually have that much write bandwidth, especially consumer grade Flashes. Anything that you can sort of plug into a, uh, you know, using a PCI, uh, uh, card might be different, but if you're talking about you know, a SATA interface, they don't actually have that much write bandwidth that they can sustain. And also, most Flash can't do very many writes before it wears out. And you know, we've seen, you know, there's Flashes now, I think the, the, the typical number of the, today is maybe between five and 10,000 overwrites. Does that sound plausible? It's a little on the low side, but yeah, th they're anywhere between 500 and a million, depending, upon depending on how much you pay. Yeah. <laughs> so if you get the cheap stuff, you might only have 500 overwrites. And so if you buy a one terabyte drive, maybe I'm showing my age, a two terabyte drive, <laughs> you can only write a petabyte into that drive before it's used up. And I've seen cases where people said they took MySQL and they, had, they, they were having performance problems. They took out a disk drive, plugged in an SSD, and six weeks later, the drive is burnt out because you only get so many writes. So the advantage of these data structures for Flash is not so much that it, it's faster, but that it writes less. And also that it's very friendly for compression, which is more writing less. Writing less is the, is the key win for Flash. Um, and I don't know what's going to happen when we have other memory technologies like, uh, you know, PCM or something, but... For, just worse PCM. What? Everything, everything's, everything's great. No, everything's, everything's, with PCM. everything's bad with PCM. Because it writes so fast, you can wear it out in seconds. <laughs> I understood. I had understood that PCM doesn't wear out, but it no, does. No. PCM wears the oh. dangerously fast. Okay, that's great. That's great for my research. <laughs> now, the one that you want is uh, SFTTM RAM because it has no wear. I'll have to I find out what that is. So, yeah. in your talk, because you're at 52 out of 51 slides. 
<laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> Gracefully. It's 52 out of 51. He's done. <laughs> okay. This is the. the <laughs> Do you have a question? Or? No, well, I just want you to finish. Okay. You didn't answer your questions. Just finish your talk. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we argue about whether I should finish? <laughs> so, so this is a benchmark that, that Tim ran, <laughs> not Mark, Tim Callahan, uh, where he measured the, the MongoDB version. MongoDB is, is, a, is a great straw horse because MongoDB has a very slow implementation of a bee tree. It's like you compare it to any of the other bee trees, it's like something from the 80s. Um, but, so, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a good stalking horse. So this is, this is an axis where this is a, a, how, many in, how many seconds have passed in the application and this is how many IOs have happened. This is for an insertion benchmark which is maintaining three random indexes. And so as time goes on the database gets bigger and bigger and the IOs per second that, you know, and, and this is the, doing the same application. So TokuDB is done here and it's done here at less than 10,000 seconds. And MongoDB is done here at about 115,000 seconds. So it's kind of a funny, funny measurement because that direction isn't really progress and that isn't really good. It's more IOs, but it's, that's cost. So, so the sooner you finish and the less area under the curve, because the area under the curve is the total number of IOs you've done. So this is the number of IOs that happened with uh, basically a B to the epsilon tree, which is what Tokutech mostly uses. And this is the number of IOs. And the IOs are bigger for Tokutech than they are for, for, Mo for Mongo. So it's not a completely fair comparison because I'm counting IOs here. If you count, if I were to draw this graph where it was scaled not in IOs per second, but in megabytes per second on this axis, it, there's a 70-fold difference instead of the 500-fold the difference or whatever that, that this graph shows. So that's, that's my end slide that brackets the... <laughs> I can't explain the numbering. That's, you know, LaTeX has always done math properly before, but... <laughs> 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 